All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Job chapter 31, where we see Job's reply continued. A little bit longer chapter. It's a little bit more to cover here. So now Job searches for a reason, even in this early treatise. Job has learned that to keep clean before God, he has to be careful about what he sees. So he makes a covenant with his eyes. And this whole chapter is occupied with Job's solemn oath of innocence, and it was his final and explicit answer to the line of argument that was adopted by his three friends. All right, so let's take the first four verses where Job proclaims his innocence, where he says he's not guilty of lust. All right, verse 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above, and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked, and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he, God, not see my ways, and count all my steps? So have I... I have made a covenant with my eyes, and then I should look upon a young woman. So in this section, Job protested that he was a godly and blameless man, at least on a human scale. And his larger context was to explain the sense of injustice he felt at his suffering and humiliation, and to make his final defense before his friends who accused him of special sin deserving of special judgment. So this chapter has an interesting similarity to ancient defense documents. The material is similar in form, if not in content, to the negative confession given by the deceased who stands before Osiris in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Under oath, the subject lists the evil things he has not done with the hope that he will be vindicated and pass through the portals unscathed. So it is an oath of clearance in the form of negative confession. The procedure was well known in ancient jurisprudence. A crime could be disowned by calling down a curse on oneself if one had committed it. Yet it also has a clear connection to the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 31 is Job's Sermon on the Mount. For in it, he touches on many of the same issues of spiritual ethics that Jesus covers in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, including the relationship between lust and adultery in Job chapter 31, verse 1 and verses 9 through 12, loving one's neighbor as oneself in Job chapter 31, verses 13 through 15, almsgiving and social justice in Job chapter 31, verses 16 through 23, and the love of money and other idolatries in Job chapter 31, verses 24 through 28. So we are clearly told in Job chapter 1 that Job was a blameless and upright man. This is the chapter that most clearly explains what that godly life looked like. So pay attention. The chapter that we now open breathes almost or quite throughout a spirit that belongs rather to the new uh, than to the old covenant. It is a practical anticipation of much of the teaching that was to come from him, God, who sat down and taught his disciples on the mountain. It is the picture of one perfect and upright who feared God and eschewed evil. Right? So I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? So in this, in defending his righteous life, Job began with explaining that he was a morally pure man who did not look upon a young woman in impure and inappropriate ways. It is significant that in this long section where Job explained his righteous life that he began with noting that he guarded his eyes from lustful looks upon a young woman. This rightly suggests that a man's ability to not look upon lustful images is an important indicator of his general righteousness and blamelessness. This also suggests that the eyes are the gateway for lust, especially for men. This is demonstrated over and over again by both personal experience and empirical study. When a man places enticing, sensual, lust-inducing images before his eyes, it is a form of foreplay, especially considering that it is often or frequently causes some level of sexual arousal in the man. In Hebrew, the same word signifieth both the eye and a fountain. To show, saith one, that from the eye as a fountain floweth both sin and misery. So lustfully consider her beauty, till my heart be hot as oven with lawless lusts, and my body be moiled with that abominable filth. Look upon the woeful chain of David's lust, and remember how many died of the wound in the eye. So a covenant with my eyes. Job's ability to control himself was connected with a covenant he made. He made a vow, a promise, a commitment with his own eyes that he would not look upon a young woman in a sinful way. Bollinger will say that the Hebrew does not literally say that Job made a covenant with his eyes, not made with. The covenant here was made with God against his eyes, which are regarded as an enemy likely to lead him astray. When Job says that he has made a covenant with his eyes to abstain from lust, he does not mean that he has stopped experiencing lust altogether. 
What he means is that he refuses to dwell upon the lustful feelings which, as the normal red-blooded male he is, come to him very naturally. So Job insisted that he would not look upon a young woman, a maiden, in this way. This was especially meaningful because in that culture it would be somewhat accepted for a rich and powerful man like Job to seduce or even ravish a maiden, and then add her as either a wife or a concubine. And Job restrained himself from women that others in his same circumstances would not restrain themselves from. So he restrained himself from the very thoughts and desires of filthiness with such persons wherewith the generality of men allow themselves to commit gross fornication, as deeming it to, have, to be either none or but a very little sin. And this is the one he starts with. And for what is the allotment of God from above? So in the context of Job's self-control, when it came to lust, he considered what the allotment of God from above was. He understood that the young woman that he would be enticed to look upon was not the allotment of God for him. She and her nakedness did not belong to Job in any sense. Leviticus chapter 18 verses 1 through 18 will reinforce this biblical principle. It relates to how the nakedness of an individual belongs to that individual and their spouse, and it does not belong to anyone else. Therefore, when a man looks upon the nakedness of a woman who is not his wife, he takes something that does not belong to him. And there has certainly existed some type of pornography in Job's day. Some of the earliest artistic images are of women and men in highly sexualized motives. Nevertheless, Job certainly did not have to contend with the sophisticated, gigantic, and far-reaching modern pornography industry. The availability of modern pornography has made it a significantly greater challenge for men to confine their visual arousal to the allotment of God from above for them. In this context, it is helpful for a man to ask himself whose nakedness belongs to me and whose does not. Only a proud and depraved man would think that every woman's nakedness belongs to him. And a moment of thought reinforces the clear principle that only the nakedness of his own wife is the allotment of God from above for a man. Only his own wife is the inheritance of the Almighty from on high for his visual arousal. And hereby... We plainly see that the command of Christ in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 was no new command peculiar to the gospel, as some would have it, but the very same which the law of God revealed in his word and written in men's hearts by nature. <clears throat> and is not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the uh, workers of iniquity. So in the context of Job's self-control when it came to lust, he also considered the destructive nature of allowing oneself to be aroused by alluring images. And he perhaps considered the lives of others that have been destroyed by lust and sexual sin that began with visual arousal. You'll note David and how King David was visually aroused with Bathsheba. So for in those days he knew well, he tells us, that God had assigned his heaviest judgments as the sure inheritance of those who infringe that noble law of purity which lifts man above the brute. So the potential for destruction is all the more real in the modern world because the challenges to biblical purity are all the more formidable. Using very rough estimates, we can compare the world of a man in the year of uh, 1500 AD to the world of 2000 AD. So in 1500, the average age of a man's economic independence was 16. Today it's 26. In 1500, the average age of marriage for a man was 18. Today it's 28 or more. In 1500, the average age of male puberty, uh, puberty was 20. Today it's 12. So the ruin of impure souls is infallible, unsupportable, unavoidable. If God hath aversion from all other sinners, he hath hatred and horror for the unchaste. Such stinking goats shall he uh, set on the left hand and sent to hell, where they shall have so much more of the punishment as they had here of sensual and sinful pleasure. be a sour sauce to their sweet uh, sweet meats. 
So this means that there are many biological, cultural, economic, social, and technological factors that make it much more difficult for a man today to make a covenant with his eyes to not look upon a young woman in the sense meant here by Job. It is much more difficult for a man to choose satisfaction with the allotment of God from above and to avoid the destruction and disaster that Job spoke of. Nevertheless, by the power of God's Spirit, it can be done. And obedience to God in this area is a precious, wonderful sacrifice made unto Him, a genuine way to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto Him and not being conformed to the world. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which states, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, uh, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's Paul speaking to Gentiles. That's us. So he does not see all my ways and count all my steps. So in the context of Job's self-control when it came to lust, it was helpful for him to consider what God's eye was upon him all the time. Most men indulge in ungodly visual arousal with the at least temporary delusion that their conduct is unseen by God. It helped Job to know that God did see all of his ways. All right, verses 5 through 8, where he's going to say that he wasn't guilty of falsehood. And if I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales, that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. So walked with falsehood. So Job also proclaimed his blameless life because he lived an essentially truthful life. He was not afraid to be weighed on honest scales and have his life examined in an honest way. So the self-curse of crop failure in Job chapter 31 verse 8 will suggest that verse 5 refers to shady business practices. So if my step had turned from the way, uh, then let, let me sow and another eat. So Job was not afraid to call a curse upon himself if he indeed was not an honest man. He was willing to be deprived of the fruit of his own labor if it was true that he was found lacking in the honest scales of God's judgment. So the confidence Job had in calling curses upon himself if he were not truthful is impressive. It is, uh, it is as if he had said to his friends, Do you think that I'm trying to make out before God that I am uh, what I have not been? Would I talk to God with what would be blatant insolence if I had not the facts to back me up? All right. Verses 9 through 12, where he's going to say he wasn't an adulterer. So if my heart had been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, and let others bow down over her. And that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment, for that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. So the next area of integrity Job proclaimed had to do with faithfulness to his wife within the marriage. He understood that this had more than a sexual aspect, perhaps first mentioned in Job chapter 31 verses 1 through 4, but also included the heart being enticed. So Job touched upon a significant truth, that it was entirely possible to allow one's heart to be enticed by another. These things happen because of choices that one makes, not merely because one has been acted upon by the mystical or magical power of romantic love. And instead, Job insisted that for him to have his heart enticed by another would be wickedness, and indeed it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. And he understood that he had control over whom he would allow his heart to be enticed by. So the phrase is very emphatical, and it takes from himself and others the vain excuses wherewith men use to palate their sins by pretending that they did not design the wickedness, but were merely drawn in and seduced by the strong enticements and provocations of others, all which Job supposed and yet nevertheless owns the great guilt of such practices even in that case, as well knowing that temptation to sin is no justification of it. Right? Then let my wife grind for another. And Job insisted that if he had been unfaithful in heart or in action towards his wife, then he would deserve to have his wife taken from him and given to another, right? To basically say, let her be his slave, or rather, let her be his whore, and may they, uh, my sin, which has served her, for example, serve her also for excuse. So let others bow down upon her is another modest expression of a filthy action. 
whereby the Holy Ghost gives us a pattern and a precept to avoid not only unclean actions, but also immodest expressions. Note the contrast. And Job is so conscious of his own innocence that he is willing uh, it should be put to the utmost proof. And if he's found guilty, that he may be exposed to the most distressing and humiliating punishment, even to that of being deprived of his goods, bereaved of his children, his wife to be made a slave, and subjected to all the indignities in that state. Right, And it goes on to say, for that would be a fire that consumes to destruction. So Job also understood that allowing his heart to be enticed by a woman other than his wife would bring a destructive, burned-over result. And root out all my increase. Many men who feel themselves under oppressive alimony or child support payments because they allowed their hearts to be enticed by another woman have lived by this statement by Job and have seen all their increase rooted out. In this, we can see that Job was tempted to adultery, but he resisted the temptation. The devil's fire fell upon wet tender, and if he knocked at Job's door, uh, there was nobody at home to look out at the window and let him in. For he considered the punishment both human in Job chapter 31 verse 11 and divine in chapter 31 verse 12 due to this great wickedness. Right? So no adultery here and no injustice to his servants. Let's continue on. Verses 13 through 15, where he didn't treat his servants cruelly. So if I despise my the cause of my male or female servant when they complain against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did, it, did not he who made me in the womb make them? And did not the same one fashion us in the womb? So Job continued the presentation of his own righteousness by noting the good and compassionate treatment of his servants. The goodness of a man or a woman is often best indicated by how they treat those thought to be inferior to them, not how they treat their peers or those thought to be superior to them. It's very telling when someone treats subordinates certain ways. So what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? So one reason Job treated his servants well was because he understood that he would have to answer to God for his action towards others, including his servants. He understood that God cared about his servants and would avenge ill treatment for them. So this section will embody a human ethic that is unmatched in the ancient world. And here again, Job showed a heart for holiness and ethical living that would be later clearly explained in the New Testament, where Paul gave much the same idea in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, where he told masters to treat their servants well, where he says, And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Right, And he goes on to say, Did he not make me who in the womb with, uh, make them? <clears throat> Did not he who made me in the womb make them? So another reason Job treated his servants well was because he recognized their essential humanity. This was both remarkable and admirable in a time when it was almost universally understood that servants and slaves were subhuman next to those whom they served. And you can think of this and and contrast it with the laws or the feelings of slaveholders in Greece or Rome, or in times much nearer our own times, in a Christian Jamaica in the days of our fathers, or in a Christian North America in our own time. So we're going to see no injustice towards the poor and defenseless. Verses 16 through 23, he did not victimize the poor or the weak. All right, verse 16. If I have kept the poor from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to fail or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it. But from my youth I reared him as a father and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of understanding or any poor man without covering, if his heart is not blessed me and if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw that I had help in the gate. Then let my arm fall from my shoulder, and let my arm be torn from the socket. For the destruction from God is a terror to me, and because his magnificence I cannot endure. So have kept the poor from their desire, caused the eyes of the widow to fail. So as a further testimony to his righteousness, Job insisted that he had been good and kind to the poor and the helpless, such as the widow and the fatherless. 
And he said, uh, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of nothing, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. So in the same manner as before, Job called a curse upon himself as if it were, uh, that if it was true that he had not cared for the poor and helpless as he claimed he had, then he knew that if he had been cruel and oppressive to the poor and needy, that he would indeed deserve punishment. And this was part of his motivation to care the way that he did, right? For, for destruction from God is a terror to me. So most of the good deeds that Job presents as evidence of his righteousness are simple, ordinary things. More than any one of these acts alone is the accumulation of them that is, you know, impressive. All right, verses 24 through 28, we'll see no trust in wealth, no secret idolatry, and no gloating of the misfortune of others where he was not greedy or a seeker of false gods. All right, verse 24. If I have made gold my hope, or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because my hand had gained much. If I have observed the sun when it shines, or the moon moving in brightness, so that my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand. This also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. So if I made gold my hope. So Job knew that wealthy men often found it easy to trust in riches. Therefore, he again insisted that he had not made riches his hope or confidence, and also he had not rejected because uh, his wealth was great. And he goes on to say, if I have observed the sun when it shines. So Job meant that he had not engaged in the common practice of sun worship. His heart was not secretly enticed to idolatry, which was apparently sometimes worshipped with the kissing of a hand. And if I have observed the sun, so not simply nor only with admiration, for it is a glorious work of God, which we ought to contemplate and admire, but for the end here following as to ascribe it to the honor peculiar to God. And when idols were out of reach to idolaters, that they could not kiss them, they used to kiss their hands, and as it were, to throw kisses at them, of which we have many examples in heathen writers today. So this would be an iniquity deserving a judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. So it is probable, though not certain, that Job wrote this before any of the other received books of Scripture were given. Therefore, he knew that idolatry was wrong by both natural revelation, uh, revelation and by conscience. He knew that since there was a true living God enthroned in the heavens, it was an iniquity deserving of judgment to deny the God who is above and to worship any other. All right, verses 29 through 34, where we see that he was generally without blame. So if I, if I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, or lifted myself up when evil found him, indeed I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse of, on his soul. If the men of my tent have not said, Who is there that have not been satisfied with his meat? But no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have covered the, my transgressions as Adam, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt of families, so that I kept silence and did not go out the door. So as further testimony to his personal righteousness, Job claimed that he had not been happy when his enemies had suffered and been destroyed. This is certainly one mark of a man after God's heart, who also takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, which states, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, that I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Right? So asking for a curse on his soul. So Job did not even curse his enemies. He kept himself from this most natural reaction. And no sojourner had a lodge in the street. So Job was also a diligent man when it came to hospitality. He would not allow a visitor to sleep on the street. And instead he opened his doors to the traveler. And he covered his transgressions as Adam, hiding his iniquity. So the basic and consistent argument of Job's friends against him was that though he appeared to be righteous, he really must be covering some serious sin that made sense of the calamity that came against him. Therefore, Job insisted that he was not covering his sins as Adam, who blamed Eve and vainly tried to cover his sin. So Job is never uh, dissembled, attempting to conceal his sin like Adam. So because I feared the great multitude, so here Job answered the accusation that he was motivated to hide his sin because of the fear of how it would appear before the public. Job's friends had probably 
known many seemingly righteous people who had hidden their sins and were destroyed when they were eventually exposed. And they assumed Job was like them. And Job here rightly protested that he was not like such men who hide their sin out of fear and public humiliation and contempt. Right, so he's not stingy with his wealth. He wasn't gloating over the misfortune of others, and we're going to see that he had no uh, no hypocrisy or secrets. All right, verses 35 through 37. Job's going to conclude his plea. He's going to demand an audience with God. Verse 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. And I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince. I would approach him. So it seems that Job interrupted his defense of the morality and righteousness of his life. He probably had much more he could say to defend himself, but broke off that line of reasoning, and he made a final dramatic appeal to be heard before the throne of God. Job strategically brought his oration to its climax with a sudden change in tone. He was now sure of his innocence, so confident in the truthfulness of these oaths that he affixed his signature and presented them as his defense with a challenge to God for a corresponding written indictment. The finality of his words are demonstrated by the phrase, Here is my mark. Job's statement leads, uh, it means literally, Here is my tall. Some versions will translate it like this. Here is my signature, since tall is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet and could be used like our letter X to denote a mark or a signature. Yet even more interesting is the fact that in ancient Hebrew script uh, used by another author of Job, this letter tall was a cross-shaped mark. In a sense, therefore, what Job was saying is, here is my cross, so that an almighty would answer me. So Job was absolutely convinced that what he needed was vindication, or at least an answer from God. So his friends thoroughly analyzed the situation and came to completely wrong conclusions. And Job couldn't make sense of it himself, and so here he called God to answer for what he had done. And this is the the demand that Job would later repent of in Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6, where Job would come to find that he had no right to demand an answer from God, and indeed had to be content when God seemed to refuse an answer. Right, and that my prosecutor had written a book. So this shows the profound yet understandable spiritual confusion of Job. He felt that God was his accuser, my prosecutor, when really it was Satan. And we sympathize with Job, knowing that he could not see behind the mysterious curtain that separated earth from heaven. Yet we learn from what Job should have known. And there is the consummate irony of Job's daring his accuser, whom he believes to be God, uh, but it's really Satan, to put something in writing. And of course, all along, the reader knows that Job's real accuser is not God at all, but Satan. But Job does not know this. He finds it out later. So surely I would carry it on my shoulder. So here, Job, stepping over bound, he would later repent of. He longed to have an accusation of God against him written out so that he could refute it as he had so effectively refuted his friends. And he was so confident in what he knew of himself that he said he would approach God like a prince. And Job was indeed confident in what he did know, and he was blameless and upright man who did not bring the catastrophe upon himself by his own special sin. What he was too, uh, what he was much too confident about were the things he could not see, the things that happened in the spiritual realm known to the reader in chapters 1 and 2. But this is unknown to Job in the story. And somewhat like his friends, Job thought he had it all figured out, but he didn't. He still had one more good lesson. So upon my shoulder as a trophy or a badge of honor, uh, basically saying that I should not fear or smother it, but glory in it uh, and make an open show of it. Uh, as that which give me a happy and long desired occasion of vindicating myself is basically what he's saying. And I would declare to him my number of steps. And basically what he's saying is far from being abashed, Job is belligerent to the last, eager to have his case settled. He's confident of the outcome and he's capable of giving a full account of all of his steps. All right. Verse 38 through 40, the conclusion of Job's words. So if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. 
So in this chapter, Job testified to his own integrity in the most solemn of turns, calling repeated curses upon himself if his, if his friends could indeed demonstrate that he was a conspicuous sinner worthy of conspicuous judgment or discipline from God. Now he called one more witness on his behalf, his own land and property. And I can remember when Jesus asked those to cast the first stone and write out his sins, and none could. And I can see an interesting parallel here. And uh, this was not unusual in the ancient thinking. The land of uh, is personified as the chief witness of the crimes committed on it. Job is prepared to accept the primeval curses on Adam in Genesis chapter three verse seventeen, and Cain in chapter in Genesis chapter four verse eleven. So the words of Job are ended. So it isn't that there are no more words from Job in this book of Job. He will speak again briefly in the later chapters. Yet Job is definitely done arguing his case. He's finished, right? And one more man will try in vain to fix the problem, and then God's going to appear. And we might rightly say that God, silent to this point, could not or would not appear and speak until all the arguments of man were exhausted. And that's true of us today, even on a global scale. So this is not a mere epigraph of the writer or editor. They are the concluding words which Job uttered, by which he informed his friends that he did not intend to carry the controversy any further, but that he had now said all he had meant to say. So far as he was concerned, the controversy was ended. At this point, then, we have reached the end of Job's expressions of pain. The end is silence and that is God's opportunity for speech. He often waits until we have said everything, and then, in the silence prepared for such speech, he answers. So the words of Job are ended. And he has not abused the land, not caused pollution of the environment, right? You can see how relevant this book is. So in the first round, the three are one in the contention that God always prospers the upright and punishes the perverse. Job rebutes that from his own experience. In the second round in this book, Eliphaz emphasizes that only the wicked suffer. Bildad insists that the wicked always suffer, and Zophar insists that seemingly prosperity of the wicked is short-lived. And Job rebutes each from his own experience. In the third round, the previous theories are more vehemently restated, embroidered with evasive platitudes, and again, Job rebuts from uh, experience. So if you intend to argue with Job, you had better have your arguments well in hand. He is able to see through the error of logic in their position. Their theology does not square with experience, and it is their creed that they have faith in and not in God himself. And I see a lot of people cherry-pick the book of Job, and they will do it from the chapters from the three friends of which we know from the later chapters God rebukes them because they are misapplied uh, religious argument. So it is their creed that they have faith in and not God himself. And a man with true experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And at this point, we sit where Job sits. His questions become our questions. The pressures, the riddles uh, trouble us too. And we too have learned that God is greater than any theology can contain. Yet, he is never inconsistent, never capricious, never malicious. He is loving, and yet we do not always understand what's happening. So Job had, he's had faith in the rule of God, but now at last he's begun to exercise in the God who rules. And another insight is that Job's view of himself is still woefully inadequate. He has been defending himself, yet we too have too little understanding of sin's attack upon us and the depravity of our own hearts. In Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 reads, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Desperately is can be translated also more accurately, incurably wicked, right? Incurably. Paul points out that there are depths of which we are still not aware. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 reads, But with me... It is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of a man's judgment. Yeah, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. So from here on, there is a noticeable break in the book, and you're going to see a new voice is going to be heard, and one that I can call the mystery man here. And that's the end of chapter 31. All right. <clears throat> Next chapter, we're going to see Elihu. 
in chapters 32. Thank you for joining me.